I know what you're thinking right now. Oh wow, another video on that slappy resetty trigger thing. Or maybe you're not. I don't actually know what you're thinking, to be honest. Either way, we're going to go a little deeper here in this video. We're going to talk about the progression and history of some of the silly things that ATF has decided, or at least claims, were actually machine guns. While the host of Floodbusters is a lawyer, he is not your lawyer. If you pay him, maybe, either way you slice it, the video that you are about to watch is not to be construed as legal advice. Prepare your blood pressure because we're going to talk about the history of ATF nonsense in the machine gun arena. At the end of this video, because at present it's the latest situation, we're going to talk about the rare breed situation. So stay tuned for that. For anyone who doesn't know, or for my three viewers that aren't used to U.S. gun law, let's do some real quick background. If you don't need this, or just really don't want to hear my abridged version, skip to this point where we get to the meat and potatoes. For the majority of American history, most Americans could own just about any arms that they wanted, and they could do what they wanted with them as long as they didn't hurt anyone aside from in self-defense. In 1934, the federal government was losing one of its many wars on drugs, this time over tasty, flammable drinking water. And this encouraged an underground market. The government's violent enforcement of prohibition led to an arms race and the cementing of organized crime, which, again, were winning quite handily. So the government wanted to do something, or something. All this sounds a little too familiar to us, doesn't it? Well, anyway, they mostly wanted to get rid of handguns, but didn't like machine guns either. So the government tried to ban both. Then some guys in suits got mad, and then the government said, okay, okay, how about just machine guns and things that are kind of like handguns? To which the suits said, all right. As a result, the National Firearms Act was passed, which put a huge tax on machine guns and other short firearms to make them prohibitively expensive. The idea was, if the government caught a mobster with a machine gun or a handgun, uh, actually they didn't quite get the handgun at the end of the day, they wouldn't have to worry about proving this person's involvement in alcohol trafficking, they'd just bag them for the gun charge for not paying the tax. There was never any evidence that handguns or machine guns were particularly deadly or not useful for self-defense, just that they were chosen, for whatever reason, by the mob, and they needed a way to get more mobsters. As for how this affected ordinary Americans, well, they didn't care. The government was fighting a war on alcohol drugs, and victory was more important than our silly little civil rights. So if you wanted a machine gun, you could have one, as long as you were rich and not a nationality your local law enforcement didn't like, since you would need their approval too. Fast forward to 1986, and inflation has put the $200 tax closer to an American's reach. More people were collecting machine guns, and unregistered machine guns were being used occasionally in crime. So a slick politician called Hughes was contemplating what he could do about this problem. I know, he said aloud to himself, rising up from his seat and pointing up in the air. I'll get rid of those damn registered machine guns. So Hughes snuck an amendment into a milk toast pro-gun bill, which closed the registry for new machine guns in 1986, preventing anyone from registering a new machine gun after that date. Remember, it was unregistered machine guns that were used in crime, so clearly the obvious answer was to prevent the registration of machine guns. Uh, to be honest, there were about two murders committed with registered machine guns in that period of time, both of which were committed by law enforcement officers who are some of the only people mostly exempt from the 86 ban. Oh well. Either way, that's how we got to a state of people wanting to shoot more faster, but the government saying, no, stop that. People simply enjoy shooting fast. It's fun to do, and a hell of an experience. So with necessity, the mother of all invention, people looked for ways around the prohibition on new machine guns. I'm going to talk about a couple particular firearms, but mostly we're going to be covering accessories. If we were talking about every firearm the ATF erroneously called a machine gun, we'd be here a long time. Maybe a subject for another video. I don't know. I'm also just going to say, I'm probably going to miss a few here. There, This is a, a huge area, and a lot of it isn't well documented because most of these weren't actually in public letter rulings, which were published, but 
private little back and forth correspondence between ASCII people and the ATF. One of the earliest ones here for us to talk about is the AR-15 Autoseer. For quite some time, drop-in Autoseers were sold in mail-order catalogs. This was a fun and wholesome experience. There were a host of brands such as the aptly named AR-15 Autoseer, the Drop-in Autoseer, and the Autoseer 2. The issue here is that while the NFA included the combination of parts language, it had not yet been applied here and it was unclear which combinations of parts were covered. The thought here was that the auto sears could be sold as, you know, kind of conversation pieces and not dropped into guns, and if they were dropped into the guns, the person would register a gun, kind of like it works right now with normal auto sears. We all do know what people were probably buying these drop-in auto sears for, but that was the idea at the time, and I think an idea that makes a lot of sense. As for what people were actually doing with them, obviously they were using them as ashtrays, I'm 100% sure of it. In 1981, ATF finally had enough and ruled that the SEER itself was a machine gun because it was designed and intended to be used in converting a weapon to shoot automatically. Interestingly, ATF said in this ruling that it would not be applied to auto SEERs manufactured before November 1st of 81. This is one of several bizarre frictions in the law here, as the ATF doesn't actually have the power to draw such cutoffs. Around this time, before and after, lightning links were also a thing, similar to drop-in auto sears, but mechanically awful, and only functional in full auto. These were sold in magazines until ATF got sufficiently mad at them. Still though, regardless of when the sear was made, possession of it, along with M16 fire control parts, is still considered possession of a machine gun under the NFA. And that's an interesting thing to think about here. We, we often think about just the device, but in a situation like with the drop-in auto sear, kind of like how you can buy, you know, M16 auto sears, not the drop-in type, but the regular type, and how ki all kinds of auto parts come with parts kits, which are perfectly legal to own. If you assemble it and configure it into a fully automatic weapon, well, you don't have to worry about the combination of parts language or anything like that, because guess what? The definition also says a weapon which shoots more than one shot with a single function of the trigger. So that's kind of just something to keep in mind here. When we're talking about the accessory being considered a machine gun, remember also that when it's configured into a whole weapon, it's a lot easier of a case for the ATF, at least when it comes to this auto sear type stuff. Moving on up to 1986, ATF made a series of determinations on three semi-automatic guns, which were semi-automatic versions of machine guns that fired from an open bolt. There's a lot of misinformation here, and to really understand it, you should check out my video on the specific subject, which is called the myth of the open bolt ban. To put a bow on it, though, the common perception was that criminals were getting these guns, doing simple modifications, and then hosing stuff down, so the government had to do something or something. Again, I get deeper into it in the video I did specifically on the subject, but because the weapons were identical to the machine guns with a fixed disconnector interrupting the firing cycle, the ATF was of the opinion that the weapons were designed to shoot full auto. Again, another part of that machine gun definition that's in the law. So now let's get on to the shoestring saga. This is an epic that spans a couple decades. In 1996, some mad lads sent the ATF a shoestring. The firearms technology branch examined and classified a 14 inch long shoestring with a loop on each end. One end was attached to the charging handle, the other looped around the trigger with its end exposed for the shooter's trigger finger. Because the device caused the weapon to fire repeatedly until pressure was released from the string and designed and intended to convert a semi-automatic rifle to a machine gun, the firearms technology branch determined the shoelace was a machine gun. ATF confirmed this in a 2004 letter, and then in 2007, realizing they had just been considering literally any 14-inch long shoestring a machine gun, reeled it back a little. This 2007 letter confirmed that it was ATF policy now that the shoestring itself is not a machine gun, but if it's added to a firearm in a certain way, then it becomes a machine gun. This kind of jives with the fact that the law mentioned solely and exclusively, which, you know, ought to mean something. We do other things with shoestring. So the early 2000s were an interesting time for machine gun silliness. So let's get stuck into that. Big one here I want to talk about involves our favorite whirly burly boys, Gatling guns. You see, back in 1955, we're going way back here to get up to the early 2000s, there was no ATF. It was the IRS. The industry was asking IRS what it thought of Gatling guns. 
In Revenue Ruling 55-528, IRS opined that crank-operated Gatling guns, referring to U.S. 1862 and 93 patent guns, were not machine guns, even if you attached an electric motor to one of the cranks. It would still not be a machine gun in the eyes of the IRS. The 1955 IRS did say that a Gatling gun designed only to use the handle to set off a gas-operated sequence would be a machine gun. Fast forward to 2004, when ATF pulls the classic, Nuh-uh. This ruling was in regard to the certified classic, the General Electric M134, often called the minigun. Here, ATF said that because it employed an electric motor, that it was a machine gun, and the housing was the receiver. The ATF explicitly modified the 1955 IRS ruling, suggesting that even old-as-hell Gatling guns are machine guns if you put a motor on them. Still, hand-crank actuated guns were left alone, which is nice, I guess. For us to talk now about what happened in the next year, 2005, we gotta take a trip back to 96. In 1996, Bill Akins, a Florida man and part-time Elvis impersonator, was watching a World War II documentary, desperately thinking of ways that he could waste some ammo. On the TV, he saw the barrels of twin long-recoil anti-aircraft guns reciprocating back and forth. Hey, he said to himself, that's it! So he put a Ruger 1022 action in a stock that allowed the action to slide back and forth, and then put a spring on the back of the 1022 actions. He called the device the Aikens Accelerator. Upon firing, recoil would allow the action to compress the spring, it moving rearwards in the stock, and then it would head forwards again and depress itself against the shooter's trigger finger, discharging the weapon again. Aikens secured two letters from the ATF confirming his device was completely legal, and so he poured his life savings into the project. After getting manufacturing set up, he was able to sell it for a very scant time, as in 2005, ATF changed its mind and said the retail version was a machine gun conversion device. Not because the retail version was in any way different from the ones Aikens sent in, mind you, but just because. Aikens fought hard, but ultimately lost. The ATF destroyed the Florida man's quintessentially Floridian business, and as of the late 20 teens, he was still occasionally taking Elvis gigs, though, which is cool. ATF sent communications to owners of the accelerators, directing them to render the device inoperable by removing the spring. Taking out the spring would make it no longer a machine gun, according to the ATF at that time. And an Aikens accelerator without a spring, mind you, is a bump stock. So remember this one. Now let's zip on over to 2017, where a wily group called Autoglove USA had an idea. Remember the power glove, how comfortable and useful it was? Well, how about that, but for guns? So the group slapped a hilariously sized motor onto a glove with a thumb actuator. The shooter would hold the firearm and place the device into the trigger guard, actuate the motor with their thumb, and then it would depress the trigger. They then sent it to ATF to ask what ATF thought. ATF thought this was a machine gun. In a very developed response letter, ATF appealed to the greatest authority it could think of. Itself. ATF quoted from letters that the agency had sent in 1982 and 88, where it asserted the position that an electric motor attached to a firearm in such a manner that the motor causes the weapon to fire until turned off would be a machine gun. Of course, we all know by now what happens when you ask the ATF for its opinion. But hey, at least it's consistent here. Oh wait, no, except that this was allegedly decades before they came out and reversed their 1955 ruling, which was apparently still good. Uh, there is some misunderstanding stemming from this one. Lots of people think that this stands for the proposition, the, the auto glove ban, that all electrically actuated triggers are machine guns. That's totally not the case. And there have been several semi-automatic solenoid actuated triggers that were out on the market without significant incident. Autoglove did not appeal the letter, dropped the matter, and refunded its customers, which was pretty cash money of them. Remember now what we talked about, how ATF in 2005 determined that the Aikens Accelerator was a machine gun, but one without a spring was not a machine gun. Well, in 2019, ATF played Takesies Backsies yet again. To be clear here, an Aikens Accelerator without its spring is just a bump stock, and I'm sure most of you remember these slidey stocks sitting on store shelves for years. Then an evil dude goes nuts in Las Vegas employing a bump stock. 
Of course, I know some people in the comments will be suggesting that there was no bump stock used, and that's fine. You can come at that if you want. Anyway, our president exerted pressure on ATF to deem bump stocks machine guns, and so they did. Piles of lawsuits were brought, some of which I was involved in, and the courts of appeal did that funny bendy thing they do with their spines. They bent over backwards to cure the government's illegal rulemaking by any means possible. This year, of course, 2021, has been one of epic proportions for total nonsense in this area. First, there was the auto key card, a literal drawing of an auto seer on a steel card. This isn't the pop-out auto key cards, the like of which were the type sold in Shotgun News and those sorts of publications years ago, but literally a laser engraved drawing. In the indictment, ATF admitted to spending considerable time tracing the outline with a Dremel, doing transformative labor to make it into a lightning link. As of right now, the owner of Auto Key Card is still in jail, awaiting trial. This case is probably the most extreme, and it's hugely unfortunate because it actually threatens a human life. There was no cease and desist, just a clandestine operation to justify locking an enterprising man in a cage over a drawing. Of course, we also had the uh, coat hanger business. That was a lot of fun, but I don't even want to get into that. Then, of course, the Rare Breed FRT, a trigger that whacks your finger forward. We've got a more in-depth video on this here on the channel, but to put a quick one on this, a gentleman had a trigger. He asked former ATF experts their opinion. They felt it was not a machine gun. People were very upset about this, despite the fact that asking ATF's opinion has only tactical and no legal significance. It gives you no special rights and no protection against the government changing its mind. Again, see almost every other thing we've talked about this episode. So ATF issued Rare Breed a cease and desist. Not cash money, but way better than showing up to lock the owner in a cage, as the auto key card case saw. Rare Breed initiates a lawsuit to prevent ATF from making good on its threats. Then, what do we notice? At least two more of these triggers materialize. One on Big Daddy, and one from Alamo Triggers. The website hosting the Alamo Trigger claims that the inventor of this type of trigger, Thomas Allen Graves, is the progenitor of what it calls positive displacement trigger reset systems, which sounds to me like typical gun industry word salad. The horrendously written website claims that this technology was provided to Rare Breed and Alamo Triggers, among others. I haven't followed the patent breadcrumbs on this one, but this almost makes it seem like the whole thing is connected, right? I'm not saying it is, but if it were, it would be pretty slick. Think about it. It's easy for ATF to knock down and bully small players and working class guys, as they did with Auto Key Card, and like they have been planning, perhaps, with Rare Breed. But for them to go against big industry players, it takes more concerted action. The type of concerted action the government pulled in the bump stock situation. With Big Daddy and the other player emerging from the woodwork, it's not about bullying an entity into submission anymore. It's about bullying a market segment. To do that, they've got to take more serious action. They've got to test the limits of the machinery that was invoked to recategorize bump stocks, along with whatever damage that does. I don't like this movie, but I think it's going to be an interesting one to watch. Either way, that's it for today, guys. I'm sure there's some I missed, largely because many of those positions are never actually published, but just exist in correspondence between inventors and the ATF. If there's some you've heard of or want me to go into deeper detail on, please let me know in the comments. Let me just say I really appreciate you guys watching and subscribing. It makes a huge difference. If you want to support me more than that, I started up a Patreon and a Subscribestar. I've added some benefits like patron-only podcast content, Discord, and surely more to come. This kind of support will help enable me to make more content more regularly, something I'd really love to be able to do. There's also a link to the new and improved Fudbusters apparel, stickers, and of course, the classic Magic ATF ball in the description below. Thank you all so much for watching to the end and for your support. I'll see you next time. Or if you join up on Patreon or Subscribestar, I'll see you on the Discord. Remember, the anti-gun side has been working long and hard, passing laws, and trying to get more policy through like this. Anything more than minimum compliance is self-regulation. Y'all take care.
Thank mm-hmm. you.